Uh, our first speaker this morning is Andy Schwartz, and I'll be introducing him very quickly. Um, Andy received his PhD in uh, 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 physiology from the University of Minnesota in 1984. He has since worked at Johns Hopkins, the Barrow Neurological Institute, the Neurosciences Institute at San Diego, and he is uh, now a professor of neurobiology at the University of Pittsburgh, where, as you're going to see, he is doing some amazing research on the neural control of robotic limbs with direct uh, brain interfaces. So please uh, join me in welcoming Andy Schwartz to Dynamic Walking. Well, it's really uh, fun to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, arm and hand movement, but uh, I did my PhD, my thesis on locomotion. Of course, that was 30 years ago, so uh, it's fun to be able to come back to it. Um, so I'm a neurophysiologist, and I'm trying to understand um, the neural substrate for the generation of volitional movement. And if you look at the, the, the body of work that, that underlies this, it, and you look in a textbook, and you'll see that there's a part of the brain called the motor cortex. And that's the part that I'm going to be talking about today. And that's right here. There's a, you know, a couple landmarks. Central sulcus is a wrinkle right in the middle of the brain. Right in front of that is a strip of cortex called the motor cortex. And the classic way of considering this is uh, when you put electric shocks in there, you get activation of muscles on the other side. And the way it's taught in textbooks is that they're basically a string, strings, uh, like a puppet, like a marionette, between specific spots on the cortex here and, um, and different parts of the body. And you can map it out. It's real nice. There's kind of this distorted picture of the body on there so that the head and lips and face are down here. As you go up, you get shoulder and trunk and, and feet up into the central part of the brain here. And so it's, it's really kind of this easy to understand relationship between electrical activity in the brain and movement. And that's the way physicians are taught and most people taking neuroscience, that's the way they learn about brain function and control of movement, but that's not the way it really works. And one of the things I hope that you'll get at least is some broad picture of a more realistic idea of networks in the brain and how they work together to generate movement. Um, so if you kind of take a, 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 do a Gedanken experiment, say if I could take a picture of the brain and had an instrument so I could look at all the neurons firing in the brain when we generate a movement. What would it look like? Would you see little spots light up? So if you move your hand, you'd see the hand area light up by itself. Um, and, or, or would you see something else? And the answer, of course, is you see something else. In fact, every time you move, the, almost the entire brain lights up. And it lights up with very complicated patterns. And so if you could actually do the experiment and you ask somebody to draw with their hand, and you could look at their brain, you'd see something that looks like this. You'd see widespread activity. You'd see billions of neurons firing, and they would fire in a pattern that's not easy to recognize. And it would happen, this, you'd see the same general pattern every time you moved anything. Okay. So the issue then for those of us who are neurophysiologists is to try to understand something about the way that pattern relates to the generation of movement. And just to give you a little bit more background, the elements that we're looking at are neurons. These are the, the, the machinery of the brain, the elements of the brain. So if you remember way back from biology, you know, neurons have a cell body, and they have this tail, the axon, and they get inputs from other neurons. In fact, on average, each neuron in the brain gets 10,000 inputs. And there are about... Um, 10 billion neurons in the cortex. So if you just do the first order connectivity matrix, you have something like 10 to the 15th. And so when you talk about complexity, that's often what's referred to. So again, you know, that, that if you look at it with broadly, you say that's a, that's a tough, tough problem. And what we're going to do to actually monitor what's going on is to record electrical activity. So the way neurons communicate is they integrate these inputs and then there's a nonlinear threshold from these analog inputs. And if you reach it, it fires an action potential. And what we're actually looking at, we can't really see the inputs very well. 
but we can watch the action potentials by putting a microelectrode in the vicinity of the neuron and intercepting the electric field that's generated when you get an action potential. Okay, so you put a microelectrode in and you record that activity. I'll show you some examples of that. And so, if we want to interface the brain to a machine, um, we have to understand something about this code. What makes a neuron fire? When does it fire? Because we're really what we're trying to do is to control the device. So we have to have some idea. So here's a little cartoon. Imagine you have all these inputs coming in, down the dendrites, and if they sum, you get an action potential, and then we can use that to trigger our device. Okay, so that's, in, in a nutshell, what we're trying to do here. So, how, does, how do these cells normally fire? Well, the best way to do this is to look at real movements and real animals are doing purposeful behavior. So what we did years ago was to train monkeys to draw in a virtual reality environment. And they'd see objects floating in front of them, they'd put their hands in there, and then they were trained to draw different shapes. And I'll show you, and then while they did that, we record neurons from their brain. So here's an example of old movie, or old experiment, but I think you can get the idea. So you, this is an action potential on a oscilloscope. You can hear it fire, and as the animal moves its hand, you can see this firing take place in a specific way. So you hear this neuron burst every time the animal moves its hand upwards, and when he moves it downwards, it stops firing. And when he just holds it steady out in front of him, is a background firing rate. You see, it's, it's very robust. It's a nice, clean signal. You're watching action potentials from a single neuron. So I'm recording one of those 10 billion neurons in the brain with a microelectrode that's about 10 micron tip, and I'm recording the action potentials from just an individual neuron. And so if I ask you, you know, what's driving that neuron? What's making that neuron fire? And what you saw is, you know, when the guy's going around a circle, when he goes upwards, that neuron fires. When he goes downwards, it shuts up. So you'd say, well, it seems to be something about the direction of movement. And that turns out to be a very robust finding. And we can just map that real quickly but by doing another experiment in which we have an animal move now in eight different directions. So we've recognized that movement direction is an important parameter. We want to explore that a little bit more, so we designed an experiment specifically to look at direction, and we have the animal move from a, on a tabletop in eight different directions. And you can see this is a display of firing rate, so each of these is a single trial. Each tick mark is when an action potential fired. They're all aligned to the onset of movement. And the take home message is that when he moved upwards, you see a lot of these tick marks, meaning that the neuron fired a lot. When he moved downwards, you actually see it shut off. And in between, there's a graded amount of activity. So if we plotted movement direction down here and firing rate on this axis, and here are data points right here, you can see that there's a direction of movement right in here that the neuron tends to fire at its maximum rate. And that's upwards, as you can see up here. And we label this as the neuron's preferred direction. So now we have a relationship that maps discharge rate to movement direction. And we fit that with this cosine function. And the you know, cosine function is interesting for a number of reasons, but right now you can see that it spans all directions. So rather than just have a, a single direction that the neuron fires in, this neuron changes its discharge rate continuously throughout the directional domain. So there's information of all directions in this firing rate. So what we're going to do is just build a model of that firing rate. So we have the firing rate equals uh, directional components. So we have an x and y because it's moving in two dimensions. And so mx, my are the coordinates of the direction. bx and by are, are regression coefficients. And so this is a model of what makes a neuron fire. And so we have movement direction. We have regressors. And if we look at this a little bit more, we can think of this as two vectors. We have this movement vector, which is the direction of movement, and then we have this, what we call preferred direction vector, which are really the regression coefficients. And you can see that really what this is, is a dot product between those two vectors. And you can rewrite the dot product as the cosine uh, between those two vectors, and that cosine function is what I just showed you in the data fit. And so just to think of this real quickly, uh, graphically, you have a vector pointing in the direction of movement. You have this 
preferred direction vector, which remains constant for this neuron. This is the label for a particular neuron. The one I just showed you had a preferred direction going upwards. You take the projection of the movement vector onto that, and the length of this vector is the discharge rate. Okay, that, that this is an intuitive idea of what makes a neuron fire. And if you change movements, you get a different length, so that if you're going perpendicular to the preferred direction, that B vector gets very short. In other words, you're firing at that background rate. So remember when the monkey was just holding his hand out there, the neuron was firing at its background rate. If you move downward, you actually drop below that background rate, so you, you, know, you get this negative relationship. But the important thing is that you can think of this model as just a projection of two vectors. You have a parameter, which in this case is movement direction, and then you have this uh, preferred direction uh, vector, which is, think of what makes the neuron fire. Okay, what are the set of parameters that makes the neuron fire at its maximum rate? And I'm going to go back to this model because throughout the talk, I'm going to, um, you know, extend this model to more and more parameters. But the basic principle is the same. Just think of this as a projection of two vectors. I'm just increasing the number of dimensions in those vectors. But the relationship stays the same. Okay. So what I just showed you is what we call an encoding model. We're looking at parameters that make a firing rate. And the reason I'm doing this, the reason I'm building a model, is because really what I want to do is I want to invert it. Now, you know, a lot of people in this business do classifiers. You know, you can do a support vector machine um, and just try to match discharge rates to a bunch of other things. And you can do that fairly well, but you don't have an underlying model. So the, the nice thing about a model, as my friend like Steve Chase would say, is that you can invert it. Once you have the model, you can invert it. So what I want to do is I want to look at the discharge rates of neurons and then predict the direction of movement. So I'm, I'm what we call decoding, okay? And the way I do this is I need to record from many neurons because the tuning function of any given neuron doesn't contain enough information to give me a good answer for decoding. And so each of these blue vectors is one of those B vectors that I just showed you. It's a preferred direction of a neuron. Neurons have all sorts of different preferred directions. They span the entire domain of my space. And you can see here that I get a good representation of all directions with a, with a collection of neurons. So these are about 350 different neurons. And then what I do is I just show you at an instant in time how fast that neuron's firing. And I represent that by the length of the vector. Okay, so you can see that some of these vectors are very long, some of them are very short. And then what I do for my decode operation is I just take the vector sum, or the vector average, I just add up all these vectors, and the resultant vector is this yellow vector right here, and that's what I call my population vector, and that's my prediction of movement. Okay? So I, I'm looking at all these neurons, looking at their discharge rates, with the knowledge of their preferred directions, I can perform this operation to extract movement direction from the brain. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that throughout a movement, and I'm going to stop every 30 milliseconds throughout that movement, calculate one of these vectors, and then watch the, pro the um, progression of directions through the task. And the task I'm showing you is a drawing task. So these are real data from a real monkey, and I'll show you how well I can extract movement direction. Here it is. Okay. So what the monkey was doing was drawing a spiral from outside in and inside out. And by taking these vectors, these yellow population vectors, and connecting them tip to tail, performing an integration operation on this, I'm able to extract trajectory. So uh, as all of you know, traject what I just showed you here, this spiral, is a set of positions. In order to get positions, by integrating, I must have used velocity. So really what these yellow vectors are are velocity vectors. If you think of a velocity vector as a direction, as I just showed you, and it just turns, so it turns out that when I perform this operation on the population vector, the length of the vector is speed. Okay, it's the magnitude. The magnitude of the vector is speed. And so if I have speed and direction, that's velocity. And I integrate the velocity, I get trajectory. And this leads to an isomorphic representation of the animal's arm trajectory. Okay, that's the key. That's what I'm doing. So now I have the tool to extract trajectories from the brain. It works very well, it's very robust, it's high fidelity. 
Okay, so what does it mean? Well, it shows you that natural movement can be decoded from movement direction. And if you think about it a little bit more, what it means is the coordinate system that I'm talking about is located on the moving effector. So the, the velocity vector is hand-centered. Okay, so it tells you where the hand is. You know, the origin of the vector is one point in time, and at t plus one, that's the end of my velocity vector. Okay, so it moves with the hand, velocity vector with the hand. And it's showing you continuous coding. So I'm getting a continuous readout throughout the entire movement. I'm not pre-specifying the movement and letting it go ballistically. I'm controlling it continuously. Okay, so that's sort of what I can get from this. Now, if you think about it a little bit more, in terms of those, those of us who study movement, trajectory is really behavioral output. So rather than thinking about movement in terms of muscle contraction and joint displacements, the mechanics of movement, another way to think about it is behavior output. The only way you know what's going on in my head is by the way I move. Whether I'm gesturing or speaking, my diaphragm's moving, my lips, my orifices are, are shaped to project sound, okay? That's the way we communicate. That's the way we interact with our environment. Is we move, okay? And, and that's really important. That's captured in trajectories. Trajectories are, are a time series of spatial points. So those, again, there, there are certain rules of movement. And the question is, from this extraction that I do in the motor cortex, this simple model, can I extract these natural features of movement? So when you move, there's a set of rules. Essentially what you do is you slow down. One of the obvious rules, it turns out, is you slow down for curves. Okay? And if you draw a closed figure like a limniscate or figure eight, you actually draw it in segments so that as you go um, a straight part, you're going fast, you go around a curve, you slow down, you speed up to some maximum velocity, you slow down for the curve. So if you actually looked at it, you could break uh, continuous movement into segments. That's one of the, the features. So here's the red. This is what the animal actually drew. The blue is what we got from his brain. And if we look at the features um, in terms of segmentation, you see that he slowed, he speeds up. These are maximum velocities, uh, these breakpoints between the segments. And you can see we can get that from the brain activity as well. In fact, it's even more precise than that, in that if you plot curvature to the two-thirds power against angular velocity, you get a linear relationship. This is called the two-thirds power law. It was originally discovered in handwriting. But it turns out it's a characteristic of all animate movement, whether I'm pacing around the floor in a uh, cocktail party, or gesturing, or having my tongue move. Um, if you plot this, this relationship holds up. It's very nice, it's developmental. Uh, children below the age of 12 don't necessarily, they have a power law, but it's not a two-thirds power law until they reach the age of 12. It seems to settle in on it. Um, almost all animals have it, octopi have it. Um, so, uh, and then also, we, it, it's a, it has a very pr strong perceptual component. So we recognize the difference between animate and inanimate by whether or not the movement obeys this two-thirds power law. It's, uh, it's actually uh, pretty robust. And, but the point is, is that by doing this extraction here, so if you actually look at what I get from the brain, and you plot this out, you see the segmentation, but you see this linear relationship to the two-thirds power law. All right, so that is reassuring. We can get natural movement with this technique. Um, and you might ask, well, is there some sort of significance in terms of control in term, uh, with this? Well, uh, a lot of people have looked at this two-thirds power law. And if you analyze it, what it really means is that you're, you're optimizing smoothness. Okay, so by following the two-thirds power law, you get an optimally smooth trajectory. And you think, well, what, why is smoothness somehow optimal? Well, again, in terms of control, and prediction, it's much easier to control and predict things that are smooth than things that aren't smooth. What about in terms of uh, information transmission? So if we look at a density plot of a hand position of a monkey drawing an ellipse, you'll see that he spends more time in the high curvature regions of this trajectory. Now, the other thing that we could do is plot the animal's eye position. Where is the animal looking? What's he paying attention to? 
And if you look at the eye position, you might think, well, you know, he has to carefully move this. He has to stay within a template. He has to move around and around. If he grows out of the template, the trial's aborted. He doesn't get his reward. But you think he'd be paying attention very carefully so his eyes would follow his hand. Well, that's not the case. When you look at the density plot for the eye position, you see that he saccades from one corner, one region of high curvature to the other. So he's saccading back and forth, and his eyes spend most of the time in the high curvature region. Well, why is that? Well, if you look behaviorally, he makes all his mistakes on the curves. He, 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 you know, if he's going straight, he doesn't make a mistake. It's when he goes around the curve that he's likely to make a mistake. Another way of thinking about this is in terms of information capacity. Um, if the brain is really concerned about specifying direction and you're going straight, you don't need a lot of bits of information. You just, you know, the, con the control system can say, just keep doing what you did in the last time step. But if you go around a curve, there, are, you know, you have to update the information. How, how much are you going to change? Where are you going to change? Things like that. So it takes more bits of information. And so if you have a fixed channel capacity, you can see why you might have to slow down. And in terms of, you know, another way of thinking about it, where you're getting feedback here, you're getting visual feedback. To register that visual feedback takes about 250 milliseconds. By the time you can see it and act on it, it's a 250 millisecond loop. And so that's another reason, but it still goes to the idea that you need more information in the curves than you do in the straightaways. So that gives you some insight into a control strategy that, that our brain has adapted for uh, working movements. Okay. Well, the bottom line, again, is that I want to emphasize is the behavioral part of motor control. And this is a nice um, passage from uh, Melville and Moby Dick, where he's talking about Ahab walking on the, on the deck of his ship. Um, you would gaze upon the ribbon dented brow. You would see the strange footprints, the footprints of his one unsleeping, ever-pacing thought. That thought would turn in him as he turned and pacing him as he paced, completely possessing him, that it seemed the inward mold of every outer movement. Okay, so, you know, Ahab is you know, completely thinking about that well, and you can see that as he moves around the deck. And I think that's, that's what I want to emphasize. So, if we have a paralyzed individual that can't move, you know, we might say, well, we want to restore movement. But another way of thinking about the issue is we want to let this person behave. We want to let this person interact with the environment. We want to let them communicate. Um, and so that's what we're doing with our neuroprosthetics. And so I'm going to jump now to what we've been able to do. What I've shown you is we need a population of neurons. We need to record them simultaneously so we can extract the movement information in the way I showed you. Over the years, um, technology has been developed that allows us to do this. The uh, electrode I'm going to use now is called the Utah Electrode Array. It's a 4 by 4 millimeter platform. Um, this was started out as a, a cube of silicon that was sawed in this pattern and then etched to form these icicles. Uh, these, these are about a millimeter and a half long. They metalize at the tip with platinum, and uh, there's conductors on the back. I'll show you that in a second. So this is a 10 by 10. So there's 100 electrodes on here. So you take this 4 by 4 millimeter platform, you turn it upside down, you inject it into the brain, so now you're looking at the back of it. These are the um, connection pads. Here's the wire harness that goes out to uh, connectors. This is the brain. Remember I showed, talked about the central sulcus. So the nose of the animal is this way. And now we have one electrode array in the shoulder and elbow area, another one in the hand and wrist area. So we can record from about 200 electrodes simultaneously with this. So we had the, the, this monkey now. We had these arrays in his head. We record single action potentials. We find the neuron's preferred direct direction. We record from uh, hundreds of these. We take those B vectors, we add them all up to get our population vector that represents velocity at the wrist. We take this velocity command, feed it into our robot controller, and then the animal can control this device. This, uh, he actually has, in this case, four degrees of freedom that he's controlling. He has XYZ displacement up here, and now he's controlling the gripper. So if we look at the model, it's the same basic model as I showed you before. It's just a, a linear regression. So we have our regressors. We have four dimensions again. We have XYZ displacement, velocity of the hand, and we are controlling the aperture, just closing and opening the hand. It's all proportional control. And 
So what we've done now is we can put a piece of food out in the environment, in the space in front of the animal, and we can have him control this device as if he was moving his own hand to reach out, grab a piece of food, bring it to his mouth, and eat it. So this was uh, reported in 2008. So he's going for marshmallows here. And I'm sure a lot of you will recognize this as a Barrett arm. So, you know, we, he can reach anywhere in the space in front of him and get this. Now, you know, this is, again, continuous control. He's, even while he's chewing, he's controlling the arm. Uh, the, there's no assistance of any kind. It's purely his brain signal controlling it. And to give you the idea, so now, you know, he's got some marshmallow residue left on that. And he decides instead of going for the new one, he just wants to lick it off. All right, so you know, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what's under the hood here, think about this in, uh, as an engineering diagram where you have the brain in a black box. Um, the brain generates behavior. We want to capture that behavior. We do that by recoding neural activity as a population. This population goes through our extraction algorithm and we're trying to extract trajectory from that. We get an estimate of that trajectory. We call that the intended, what we think is the monkey's intended movement. We express that by moving the arm and hand. The, that results in an action that the animal can actually see. And this is a closed loop feedback. So of course, this is just a model. It's a relatively crude model. You know, you can't, couldn't be much simpler. And so this is not going to be correct. You know, we're not capturing exactly what the animal wants. Fortunately, the animal can see what we're doing. He see, he's, and then he has the ability to change the way his neurons fire to generate what he really wants. So what you get here is the idea of changing neural activity in response to stimuli. That's learning. So we're actually forcing him to learn. And the cool thing is for us as scientists, we can actually watch that take place on our electrode array. That's a whole other story. I'm not going to get into it. But the important part is that in order to make this work, is you have to take advantage of the learning that's taking place. And you have to encourage that. So this, again, this was now you know, 15 years ago, some of our early experiments. If you look at the way the neurons fit the cosine tuning function, and you look at the fit, okay, how, how good is our model? How well did the data fit our model? And you look at it over days. And you see that it, it gradually increases. So what's happening, you, you can think of this, is that the animal is learning our model. And it's making the neurons fit our model better. And as he does that, his performance increases. So if you look at the performance, okay, the performance completely mirrors that increase in our model fit. Right? So it's, it's pretty convincing. And over the years, we've amplified that. So we really encourage uh, learning to take place. All right. So let's jump ahead now. This is uh, work that was done by Sam Clanton. He's in the Robotics Institute here at CMU. MD, PhD, did his thesis in my lab. Um, what we wanted to do now was to increase the complexity of the arm. So we did that by adding a, a three-dimensional wrist. So this is a Barrett wrist. And now what the animal had to do was to reach out, and we presented cylinders in different parts of space and different orientations so that he had to orient the hand to match that of the cylinder um, to, and then grasp it. So if you look, this is kind of the set of targets that we presented to the animal. Now, as soon as we did that, we realized that there was a, an interesting question. And that's, how do you represent wrist orientation? You can think of it classically in terms of Euler angles. You can think of it in terms of uh, um, you know, anatomical supination, rotation, flexion, extension. Um, but there is, you know, turns out to be a set of problems with that. And it's illustrated here. So if you take a coordinate system, it's being centered at the middle of the wrist joint, okay, and, and you try to use that. Uh, you have a set of, I'll show you in a second, that becomes a problem. Whereas if you think about this in terms of behavior, and you say, what are you trying to do right here? Well, you have a, 
coordinate system that's at the point of contact of the object. Okay. And you can think of this, you know, if you think of Euler angles and rotations, you know, you have a problem of, as you all know, the order, right? We, you know, you have order specific. So how do you handle that? Okay, I mean, um, well, it turns out you know, in the robotics textbooks there's something called Rodriguez's formula where you can think of a virtual axis in space and all you have to do is think of that axis and then the amount of rotation about it. So essentially you're doing all your rotations simultaneously. And, and that's what we did. So what we did is we use a coordinate system here. We use Rodriguez's formula and the neural activity was very easy to relate to that. So here, just to give you the idea of what you'd have to do with the, oops. This is sort of a little cartoon. And you can see here that after you rotate, you'd have to have a displacement, where you can do it all simultaneously with the other coordinate system. <coughs> okay, so here's our formula extended now. So we have x, y, z, we have equivalent of yaw, pitch, and roll, and we have aperture. So now we're controlling seven degrees of freedom with our model. And here's the animal doing it. So you also notice that we've, uh, or Sam, uh, it's using impedance control here. So there's a fair amount of compliance as he um, interacts with the object. And even so, you can see that in that case, one of the fingers is broken. Um, we constantly are breaking our effectors. Okay, but the point is it works, all right? So, we're up to seven degrees of freedom. What about the hand? Well, the hand by itself has 23 degrees of freedom. And that's a huge problem. Um, so, as it turns out behaviorally though, for most grasping movements, the joints are coordinated. So you can imagine, you know, if you look at your interpharyngeal joints, uh, when you curl them, they all curl, right? So there's a lot of correlation amongst your joints, which means you can use dimensionality reduction, so typically what you do is you um, reduce this to a set of principal components. We reduce grasping movements to four principal components. So uh, we had the animal reach uh, and we presented different objects, different shapes, so that we could explore the uh, full hand space, uh, different shapes. We had to reach these different objects. And then we had a regression now. So now we're up to 10 degrees of freedom. Where we have these four principal components describing hand shape. And looking at the way the animal used his hand and using this model, I, we can show you how well we can predict. Um, so here's the actual hand movements. Here's what we're able to predict using this model as he reaches those objects. And you can see we get a good match. All right, so bottom line is we did our homework. Before we tried this in humans, we did this extensive set of studies in humans and mo or in monkeys. We got everything working. And then once we had everything working, we gave it to our, our we set up a clinical lab at uh, University of Pittsburgh. And about a year and a half ago, we recruited our first patient. It's a 53-year-old woman who's been paralyzed for uh, 14 years um, from the neck down. Okay, she can't move anything to lower neck. Um, we implanted two arrays, just like I showed you. and. Uh, the next, you know, we let her rest a couple days after the surgery, but while she was still in the hospital, we couldn't wait. We brought our recording amplifiers in, and we hooked them up to see what we have, and I'll show you what we got at the, the very beginning. So I just have her, we don't have any, you know, fancy equipment. I just said, hey, think about moving your hand to my hand. And while she does that, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, we recorded a single, just a single unit. Although we had 200 we could choose from. So just have her thinking about moving her hand. So you could hear this neuron fire when you thought it was in the wrist. This was an array, that, you know, this was on the lateral array um, in the wrist and hand area. Um, so it's pretty nice. Now, she, a, a few days later, she came to the lab. This was the second day of trying this. We had this arm I'll tell you about, this DARPA arm. <laughs> and we just said, hey, think about moving this arm. Not a lot of training, no training, actually. Just think about as if you're moving your own arm. 
and she was able to do it you know, within a few hours of time. So it began to set the Awesome. No, well, I, I, what we did is we had her observe movement in different directions and we built our tuning functions based on observed movement. And then we had her do this. So again, this was, you know, 3D movement um, with almost, almost right away. Okay. Um, so this arm uh, is the, the, the DARPA arm, for those of you guys that, that know. It has, um, uh, let's see, about 14 degrees, of, 14 degrees of freedom that you can actually control. So it's got a shoulder, three shoulder, one elbow, three wrist, and then the hand has uh, the remaining degrees of freedom. It has ab and adduction of all the fingers, it has individual curl, and it has thumb opposition. Right? So the hand is actually very exquisite. Uh, the, the question is, the reason we got involved is that they realized after they built it, they didn't have any way to control it. So that was our opportunity to work with them on that. Okay, so another fun thing to do is, um, you know, we're, we, we have access to the subject's brain all the time. And we can have do all sorts of experiments. So one thing that's fun to do, you know, 60 Minutes was out uh, recording. We said, what can we show them? Let's see if I can turn this up a little bit. He can isolate the brain cells or neurons firing from a certain region. So we just say, hey, Jan, turn a neuron on. Jan, now fire that neuron. How do you do that? I'm imagining opening and closing my fist. She's gotten so good at it, she can make a single brain cell fire. You just have complete control of that. You can fire sure, it any time yeah, you want to. I'm holding it still now. Here comes a big, long one. Little one, little one, little one, little one. Huh. <laughs> okay, so, you know, she, at, over the next few months, we trained her to get better and better with this device. And you can see these really nice movements she's able to make. So you can see, you know, these are coordinated movements. These are seven degree of freedom control. Here's a, my favorite. So she just did this on her own. Decided she wanted to do this task. Now this one is actually, she's using all 10 degrees of freedom. So she's actually conforming the hand to this rock. Get up and you'll see as you curl these little fingers to uh, hold the rock. So these are um, ARAT tasks. These are the same tasks that are used to quantify recovery and stroke subjects. And the idea is, you know, these are um, specified tasks and you know we time to see how long it takes and it's the amount of time it takes normals can do this in about five seconds she's in the range of normally seven to nine seconds so it's approximating normal speeds um, and the point is is that we're not just cherry picking these trials she does this every day okay she comes in she this, this is a routine for her and so what we have here are days and um you know this is a uh, hundred days um, and th this shows you learning. So what we have here is a performance index, you know, how successful was she relative to random. And you can see that she has a nice learning curve as she goes up. If you look at the seconds it takes to do this, it goes down in a steady way. If you look at the straightness of the path, path of frequency, it goes up. Um, and then, uh, you know, you can also look at another metric of that path of frequency. So she's doing this consistently every day, and she's getting better as, as she does it.
Okay, you know, again, you can do arbitrary tasks with her because, you know, uh, so she wanted to do rock, paper, scissors, and for some reason I was deprived as a child. I never learned that, so she had to teach it to me. And, uh, what? <laughs> yeah, but my paper was trying to cover his paper. <laughs> okay, ready? One, two, three, rock. Okay, so, um, you know, when we were interviewing Jan before the study, we said, you know, Jan, if we gave you this ability to move an arm again, what would you do with it? Well, we had another subject uh, before her, and he said, well, I'd like to hug my daughter. Well, not Jan. Jan said, I want to eat chocolate. So here she is. First day we tried it. It's a little shaky. That's what I'm calling a quarantine trip. And she's, you know, imagine she has this thing coming out of her face. And uh, so she's a little hesitant trying to get it there. But uh, the desire for the chocolate overcame that, I guess. So the next day, we gave her even more control over it. She was mm -hmm. a little bit faster. <laughs> so, so now she's still controlling it. So you notice that you know even while she's chewing it, she still has control over it. There we go. One small, <laughs> one small nibble for a woman. One giant bite for DSDI. <laughs> okay. All right. So it's an ongoing study. Jan still comes to the lab two or three days a week. Um, and uh, you know we're going to be doing more subjects. The next subject we have permission now, in addition to putting in the recording arrays, we're going to be putting in arrays across that central sulcus and sensory cortex and electrically activating the sensory cortex in response to the touch sensors we have on the fingertips. So we want to impart touch back to give more feedback when she's manipulating tasks. Um, and that's it. I have a bunch of colleagues over the years that we've worked with, starting at Arizona State and San Diego, now at the University of Pittsburgh, at the Medical Center. There's a lot of great clinical colleagues. Here at CMU, I work a lot with people in statistics and robotics institute. And we've had funding from a, a lot of different sources. Thank you. Hi, so this is a question from uh, a neuro, neuroanatomically ignorant person. The encoding, is there an understa understanding how that relates to some sort of intrinsic encoding? Or is this more like a testament to the plasticity of the, you know, the brain? Well, like I could, in other words, I could use a variety of encodings. So remember, we extracted this from monkeys in an open loop task. So monkeys were just reaching with their hand. They, you know, whether or not we're recording from their brain had nothing to do with their behavior. So in other words, we're looking at the activity that would take place with normal behavior. So this is the way, you know, features that happen all the time. So we're not entraining it. Now we also, as I showed you with that closed loop, once we close the loop and provide some information about what we're recording back to the animal in a behaviorally meaningful way, then we can have the animal modify his neural activity. But most of it, okay, most of our model is based on what normally happens. Okay, thank you. So uh, does that mean that you expect there's a translation from this velocity-based uh, uh, control that's happening in the motor cortex uh, to, you know, uh, muscle act? Activation yeah. so, and, and where do you think that's happening? Well, physics still has to happen, right? So I mean, 
you, you have to activate muscles and generate forces and torques and make joint displacements happen. Um, and I think some of that is probably still going on motor cortex. I think if we had models that looked at this more precisely in a different way, we could probably see this relationship to muscles because motor cortex does have a strong projection to the spinal cord and the muscles. Um, and the question is, is that transformation between what we see and muscle activity is not quite as simple as what we can see the, in the other way. In other words, we're taking the low-hanging fruit, the most obvious relationship we see in the model is this hand velocity. That's not to say there aren't other things. And the other thing is that there's a lot of other neural machinery that's on. You know, there's billions of neurons that are firing throughout not just the brain, but the midbrain and, you know, all the way down through the spinal cord. So there's a lot of processing going on that could be performing that transformation. So the bottom line is we don't really know where it's taking place, but it obviously is happening one way or another. Um, can you tell us how good this direct neural sensing is compared to the skin sense, the, the skin sensing, you know, the games, the games, how, 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 how much better is, is one than the other? Or? I can't give you an exact number, but... Maybe explain what, what I'm talking about. Just yeah, so, so the, what he's talking about is you can put electrodes on the brain. You've seen these caps that people wear, and you capture what's called EEG activity. So this is summed activity from many neurons firing at the same time from large regions of the brain are being integrated. The trouble is, is that um, that gets heavily filtered by the time you get to the brain. So the frequency content is very low, the, the, the frequency you have. The spatial resolution is very poor because it's being filtered by the skull and the scalp by the time you get to see it. Um, and so the, you lose a lot of information. You don't get anywhere near the information content you do for a single neuron. And as a result, when you try to control something with that, it's very, very poor control. Um, so uh, you can get some sort of stereotypic waves. For instance, um, when you present a stimulus, there's sort of the surprise factor. It's called a P300 wave. And you can learn to recognize that from the EEG signal. And that's almost the only, the, the only utility that people are getting from BCIs is triggered on this P300 wave. And so you, we can make spellers, so yes or no decision. Is that the letter I want or isn't it? And so it's a very, very slow operation. So th that's where it's at right now. So I have two follow-up questions. Uh, one is just your, your sampling from 100 to 200 neurons, and yet, so this, the coding must be highly distributed that you're just kind of sampling this small subset of cells, and yet it's coding all of the degrees of freedom you need to control an arm. Um, what does that imply about the motor cortex? Um, and the other question is, there are other groups that are doing um, kind of uh, learning system, I mean, uh, classifiers or correlation systems and so on. Do you think they're converging on the same model, or is the fact that there's learning in the loop by the patient mean that, you know, similar question, can people converge on different models? So is there an advantage to actually going in with, a, with an a priori model as, as you have? So uh, I'm heavily biased toward the model approach versus the classifier. Classifiers are incredibly powerful. The, the ni nice thing about classifiers is you don't need to know anything. Right? Anybody that, that, that put data into a MATLAB routine to get an answer. And it will tell you, give you a hint as to what's classified and what's not, but it won't give you any underlying principles. And so you have a classifier. The trouble with classifiers is you can't interpolate between the categories and you can't extrapolate. So, so you're locked to whatever library you have. And depending on how well these categories are separated, um, that's, that's, you're entirely bound to that. So that's the problem. Uh, you can't invert classifications. So, um, you know, there, there are a number of issues with that. And in terms of sampling, yes, uh, motor cortex, the nice thing about it is, although there's a broad somatotopy, you know, of these different parts of the motor cortex, within, the, within a certain region, there's a big mix of what you're drawing from. And we're trying to get as rich a distribution. It's more important that we get a uniform distribution through the space then we get you know, really high resolution between those things. So these are all issues, they're sampling issues, and um, they definitely limit what we're able to do, but at least we understand what those limits are. Hi, yeah, first, um, 
really like the work. It's great stuff. I have a bit more of a practical question, and it's kind of a two-part question. So one, uh, what's the lifetime like on an implant like this, and do you see any issues with bio biocompatibility or rejection of these uh, electrode interfaces? And you mentioned you want to start doing stimulation, and I know that can be much more problematic in terms of biocompatibility, inflammation response, scar tissue formation. So has the chip technology itself evolved to the point where we could expect these to be a long-term possibility? So you're absolutely right. Right now we're limited. Um, the, the recording right. quality, we'll the ability to record right isolated single okay. units decreases continuously. Um, so after a couple of years, the number of single units you can see on your electrode goes down <laughs> dramatically. You can still get information from multi-unit activity, so even though you can't see isolated action potentials, you can just do a, some sort of trigger, uh, amplitude trigger and threshold trigger, and, and still use that as useful information. But we really would like to be able to preserve the recording quality over time. And there's a number of technologies that are being developed. Uh, one thing that we've done, actually, I, I can show you. We, we're actually putting bioactive molecules, attaching them to the electrode. So there's a one molecule we're using. This one is actually called L1. It's an adhesion molecule that's you know, naturally uh, um, there. So it sort of guides growing neurons to their targets. And so what we've done is we put this on our electrodes. And when you inject these in, sprouting naturally occurs from axons all around it. And they actually come and basically looks like they're attaching to the electrode. And that gives us these incredible recordings. So here's one channel. And in, from that one channel, you can see these different waveforms that are very distinct. And we can set up our discriminators to pull out up to nine different neurons, action potentials from, different, from one electrode. And this persists um, for many days. Okay? And um, you know, we can actually dramatically increase our yield by doing this. And if you actually look at this one channel, this is now over 75 days, you can see that we can maintain the waveform so, you know, good question. I happen to <laughs> have some slides ready for that. Um, we're making some, some really nice progress. And there's also, you know, different types of electrodes. You can make, if, it turns out if you make the electrodes um, of a diameter that's less than six microns, the system tends to ignore that. And so you don't get any of these reactions. Um, you can make them very flexible so you have a better tissue compliance uh, miss, uh, matching. Uh, there are a number of things that are being done. Um, it seems like you, when you're recording from the cortex, you should know the um, intent, right? Like, so that you, you'll be able to have some lead time over when the uh, movement would normally occur. So in the monkey, for example, in this case, where the recordings you're making um, are in advance of, of when the movement occurs. Is that the case? And can you take advantage of that? I didn't see it explicitly sort of represented in the models that were up there. Yeah, so when you have you know, open loop, when you look at uh, ongoing movements from a healthy individual and you look at this predictive uh, signal that we get, if you look at the velocity vector and then you match the velocity vector that would occur in the behavior, you can get a time lag. And that time lag is about 150 milliseconds. So w it is predictive. The interesting, you know, there's a bunch of papers we wrote about this, but it turns out when you go through a high curvature region, that lag actually shortens. Okay. And then it lengthens for the straight part. Um, so in terms of prosthetic control, the nice thing is, is that when you see this signal, and by the time you process it and turn it back into a movement, it takes about that same amount of time. So it's about 1 to 200 milliseconds between when we recognize that velocity signal in the prosthetic case and we actually generate it in the robot. It's about 100 to 200 millisecond lag. So we're within the same lag as what would normally occur. No, I can't. <laughs> uh, so um, you've been working in the motor cortex for years, and now you say you're going into the somatosensory cortex. Um, you know, the topography of these different regions is, there's been some question about how topographic they actually are. Um, motor cortex particularly is a bit of a mess topographically. And so you're moving into somatosensory cortex. Do you think the techniques are going to apply 
to the somatosensory cortex in the same way, or are there new challenges when you start dealing with sensory issues? Well, in primates, the maps in motor cortex and sensory cortex are kind of mirror image. But, but when you actually get into the details of the map, in somatosensory cortex, they're much more detailed. So finger units are next to finger units. That's not necessarily the case in motor cortex. When you actually look in it, you get a finger next to an elbow, next to a shoulder, you know. Um, so, and the regions are, are pretty big for the hand area. So the question is, how do we cover the whole hand, hand area? That becomes more difficult. And then also, um, they're different within the sensory cortex. There are a lot of things in the sulcus. So the best, the primary sensory cortex, the part that has the highest resolution is actually in the bank. And we can't really access that with the same electrode. But there's another area up on the top that, that still works pretty well. And, the, and we haven't done as much work. We've done some of this work. But uh, the group in Chicago, uh, Sleeman Banzamea, has, has done a detailed study to look at this. And you can get a very nice mapping. And you can see this, the behavioral consequence of activating these neurons in different kinds of psychophysical tasks. So it looks like it's going to work. Um, the issues are, are different. So we get this really nice high resolution movement output. We don't really know how to put that kind of resolution back into the sensory system. It's going to be relatively crude. And whether or not we're giving the sense of fine touch or touch or just some sort of artifact or like a, equivalent to a buzz, it's associated with that. We don't know yet. Okay? We won't know until we put it into a human so we can ask them what they feel. Um, so, um, you know, there's a lot of research that needs to be done. And we're not expecting to get, you know, super great results. But we think, you know, in terms of just provi providing some sort of feedback information, we think it's going to have utility. And then we'll have to refine it with scientific experiments. Yeah. Okay, so uh, very quick follow-up to that. Have you done the sensory... Uh, the, the, the sensory equivalent with monkeys yet, or if you are you going to save that all for human subjects? No, we're we're doing this, and in, in, so there were psychophysic experiments done in Chicago, where they would, you know, try to activate different fingers, and they would do it mechanically, and then they would, you know, replace that mechanical stimulus with one that was electrically activated, to try to see the, you know, psychophysically the animal could tell the difference. Mm -hmm. That that was that. What we've done in our lab is actually do the full test where the animal is now controlling a prosthetic device and feeling with the, with the um, artificial fingers what's going on and then responding. So we started those experiments and they're working and they're ongoing. And we have to get the, uh, the whole set of computer algorithms worked out and the encoding schemes and the stimulus parameters. We need to get that all refined before we start it in the human subject. That's ongoing work. Yeah, my, my, my actual question was, uh, is there any relationship between the kind of stuff that you're doing here and other research I've seen with amputees where you sort of tap into the sort of the, the peripheral nerves to control a uh, hand prosthetic? Or are those similar it, technologies? It's going to be related. And again, I think uh, when Doug Weber gives his talk later in the week, he's the guy to ask because he's doing both. And I, I think he can give you the best answer. Uh, so I'm always amazed that uh, the human brain is human understandable, uh, that the structure, you, you, you see simple structures like cosine tuning and things like that. Uh, I wonder, uh, the question is, let's say you made a much more complicated encoding of all the dynamics and control and things like that. Could one, is there a sense for why something like uh, cosine tuning or something Simple like this might be inevitable, or, or I don't know. I don't know if the question is clear. Yeah, or not. no. I think it's really important to try to. I really think that the kind of questions you're asking are, are very important, and you know, you're asking are there some principles we can draw from this? And right. I, I think it's important as we develop our models, we hope to encompass more parameters like dynamics, like force. If we really want to talk about manipulating objects. We have to talk about forces at the fingertips. Imagine once you grasp an object, um, you're still controlling that grasp, but there's no displacement of the fingers. So everything is force regulation at that point. How do we recognize that in a signal? What does it mean? 
How is it related to this velocity signal? You can think, you know, you can dream up all sorts of things, virtual force vectors at the fingertip, you know, you know, matching the same direction as the velocity. There's all sorts of things you can, you can dream up. Now, and, and that's what, that's the next set of experiments we're going to be doing. Um, now, in terms of cosine <coughs> tuning, I think that the really cool thing to think about this is, again, what does cosine mean? Well, I think of in terms of dot products. I think of projecting one high-dimensional vector on another high-dimensional vector. And what does that mean? It's really the correlation between a set of things that make a neuron fire and those things. Okay? And it doesn't really matter how many dimensions there are, exactly what they are. But that principle of correlation is really important. It turns out that cosine functions are found throughout the entire neural axis. So whether you're looking at primary afferents, receptors uh, for stretch muscles in the, in the ankle, uh, those are cosine tuned. You wouldn't think that they'd be cosine tuned because you'd think they'd be very linked to the length only of the muscle, which is not cosine tuned. Okay? But because of the mechanical arrangement in the muscle, um, you get cosine tuning. You see that visual system, sensory systems, you see cosine tuning everywhere. All right. Uh, thank you for amazing work. Um, I would. Uh, I hope this is a simple question. When you show the uh, uh, modeling the hand movement, your monkey uh, was allowed to use proprioception, and uh, I want to just. I'm just curious why when the monkey was moving wham arm, what the arm was actually anchored, as I uh, remember correctly, and then you cannot use the mo uh, motor spindle uh, muscle spindle feedback. Is there any reason for that? What I was showing you in that animation of the match, that was the animal using his own hand. So we yes. were looking at the animals, we were tracking the animal's fingers with 23 markers, so we have all the joint angles. And then we're matching what the animal actually did with his own hand to what we could decode from his neural signal. That was just a test of the model. Okay. <laughs> So the first speaker is Bobby Gregg. He's from the University of Texas at Dallas. Take it away. Thanks, Greg. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, great. So this work was actually done at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, but I recently joined the faculty at UC Dallas. And also, uh, Elliot is now at MIT, but it was all done in Chicago. Uh, so the motivation behind this talk is, is the somewhat contentious issue of, of whether or not there's a central pattern generator in human locomotion. Uh, so I probably don't have to say that I'm speaking to the choir here, but the idea behind central pattern generation is that there's some sort of internal timing mechanism that uh, generates feed forward patterns of muscle activation, and the, these patterns are highly modulated by feedback to have corrections to perturbation. Uh, now there's, there's another idea out there that, that perhaps uh, feedback reflex mechanisms and mechanical self-stabilization alone are enough to generate Locomotion, locomotor patterns, so no internal timing variable whatsoever. Uh, now, disclaimer, I'm a roboticist. I am not the one to answer this question, and I'm not going to try to answer this question. But I do think that some recent ideas from robotic, robotic control might educate this discussion a little bit. And so I'm going to hope to convince you uh, that in a, in a somewhat new idea that might bring these two uh, concepts together. So not too long ago, Jesse Grizzle here in the audience, Jesse, uh, did some great work where he, he implemented a control strategy on a walking robot, Mabel here, which is developed also by uh, Jonathan Hurst, that uh, uses a physical embodiment of phase of the gait cycle. So what I mean by that is that Mabel is continuously measuring her hip position relative to the foot. So as she walks forward, the hip is moving forward in a monotonic fashion. And so by measuring that hip position, uh, the robot knows where it is in the gait cycle, and then it can control the joint patterns accordingly. So it's a physical variable that it's measuring that parameterizes where it is in the gait cycle. And this, I would argue, has been a very successful approach, enabling very robust walking and running. And this is an older video. I, I highly encourage you to go to Jesse's website because there's a lot of cool stuff there.
uh, they do all sorts of great things like push this robot and try to trip it and it, and it, and it, rarely, it rarely falls and uh, it's very impressive. And so the success of this approach uh, really inspired me to think about what, what, what concepts here might be shared by humans. And so just to, to clarify what I mean by a phase variable in, in pattern generation, if you look at, at first a time-based pattern, you have time that evolves in a strictly linear fashion, it has a constant rate of evolution, and so you can tell by looking at time whether you're at 0% or 100% in the pattern. And then you can define your central pattern here as a function of time. Alternatively, you can define a, a phase-based uh, a, a central pattern where you have a, some physical variable, phi, which maybe is the hip position, maybe something else. And because it evolves monotonically, strictly increasing, or, or it could be strictly decreasing, that then you know whether you're at 0% or 100% based on where that variable is measured. And so then you, could, uh, you can define a central pattern seen here as a function of that variable rather than time. So it's a time invariant central pattern. That's kind of the general idea here. And so this motivated me to ask the question as to whether humans might do something similar in a phase-based manner. And so in order to do that, we, we ran a study where we introduced phase perturbations during human walking. And so to do that, first we have this mechanism here, which has a force plate, and this force plate measures ground reaction forces and the center of pressure. And the center of pressure is particularly important because it's monotonic. It's a candidate phase variable. So it starts at heel strike and it moves monotonically forward towards the toes during steady gait. And so if, you know, we are hypothesizing that if the human could somehow measure that variable, the human would know where he or she is in the gait cycle and control the joints accordingly. And so uh, the type of perturbations we, we conducted were, were rotational perturbations where the subject walked over this platform and the platform abruptly and unexpectedly rotated the ankle. And it would do either a dorsiflexive or a plantar flexive perturbation. And it was, it was random, so there was no no anticipation of one or the other. And so, in this case of dorsiflexion, it's knocking the ankle angle forward in the gates. So the ankle goes to a position that it would have later encountered anyway. And so if the, if the human was controlling locomotion as a function of phase, you might see a phase shift in the pattern. So let's say this is the central pattern uh, the, for the nominal case, which is hidden by the perturbed case until you get the perturbation. And then the ankle angle is, is knocked up. So first the ankle angle jumps up. But then if there is a phase variable, in this case the center of pressure, then it would also move forward. It would co-vary with the ankle angle in such a way that you jump tangentially along, along the curve. So that's what we're calling a phase shift. Now there's also a second thing that happens here because we have changed the slope of the ground. And so that, that kind of acts as a constant disturbance. So you rotate the ankle, and that, that causes this phase shift, which is more of a, which is an almost instantaneous event. And then you have this lingering effect from the slope being inclined. And so we hypothesize that the ankle pattern would jump towards the nominal incline pattern. So if this is the nominal pattern when you're walking up steady state slope, slopes, and this is the nom nominal pattern when you're walking on flat ground, you would just, uh, after some adaptation delay, you would converge towards the upslope curve. So this is our hypothesis, which has kind of motivated us to look, what, what to look for. And so for, in this study, we had nine able-bodied subjects. Um, they walked 800 times, which took a, lo a long time. Uh, some of them were not too happy with us afterwards. And 50% of the time, they were perturbed. 50% they weren't. And of those perturbations, it was, it was random between plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. Now I'm going to show you the deviation, which is the difference between the perturbed, across subject perturbed mean and the across subject non-perturbed mean, or nominal mean, because it's a little bit easier to, to look, to see what's happening. Um, and so, if you look in the time domain, so looking at the data over time, and this is normalized time, so there's no, we're not, we're not trying to bias anything. Um, we see that we don't have any convergence, and in fact we have statistical, statistically significant differences between the, the incline from the slope and the human, uh, the human trajectories. Now, if you look in the phase domain, looking at the ankle pattern, the deviation as a function of the center of pressure, well, then we see this instant, this uh, somewhat fast phase shift. I mean, the perturbation isn't really instantaneous, but there's a phase shift. It uh, travels tangential first, 
And then we see this gradual convergence towards the incline angle that we expected. And um, at the very end, there's no statistical difference between this and the incline angle. And this actually was confirmed by another study we ran afterwards with five degree perturbations. So we tried even, even larger ones and everything just scaled up nicely. So there were no surprises in the five degree case. And we recently submitted this for publication. And so there, there are many possible interpretations here. Uh, the one that, that I favor is that perhaps there is a time invariant physical embodiment of phase that, that humans use for locomotion. In which case you could, the, the, the central pattern could be, creating, could be created without an internal timing variable. So there could still be a central pattern generator which just uses feedback instead of an internal timer to generate the feed forward patterns. Uh, and, and, and in this paradigm, the idea of phase resetting would come automatically. So there have been many observations of phase, phase resetting in response to perturbations or stimulus. Uh, and this would happen automatically because the, the variable would be, would be measured. So the disturbance would be measured directly and that would influence the pattern. And uh, there's also a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, load related receptors initiate phase specific behaviors during locomotion. And uh, Max Donald has a great review paper on that. And so one way to think of the center of pressure is that it's the combination of these load-related receptors, which we know are involved in phase-specific behaviors. Now, there could be a, a different variable. Uh, you know, any un unactuated monotonic variable could be a candidate for phase. But, thank you. But um, if it is a center of pressure, then that would also explain observations of positive force feedback during powered push-off at the end of stance. And the reason for that is when a center of pressure is moving forward, that would cause a planar flex of torque in, in response to that motion, which would then in turn cause more forward motion of the center of pressure, and so it cascades. Positive force feedback. And I'll show you this um, in a second. And so the, the big take home message here is that feedback is sufficient to sustain patterns once, they're, once they've started. And so maybe central pattern generators are more like feedback pattern generators. It's, it's, it, this is just, a, this is just our, our supposition here. And another way to test this idea, or test the feasibility of this idea, is to actually implement it on a robotic system. And so we've done this now with, with a prosthetic, robotic prosthetic leg. And we just completed a study with amputee subjects in Chicago using it, the center of pressure as a phase variable to control the robotic leg. And the subjects liked it a lot. Still writing up the results. And Tommaso Lenzi is somewhere in the audience here. He was very instrumental to this work, so thanks, Tommaso. And so, to just uh, in closing, uh, we're hoping to bring ideas from robot control into both uh, our understanding of human locomotion and then enabling individuals with various types of impairments to, to walk um, and do other types of locomotor tasks. Uh, and so that's the ongoing and future work between RIC and UT Dallas. So thank you, and I'll be happy to discuss. A little bit of a misnomer then, right? <laughs> so you could certainly think of, of estimating, yeah, it depends, it depends what, are, what are you estimating? What state are you estimating, right? So it could, it could be that you're estimating all variables of the system to try to feed forward all, all the variables, or you could be estimating just one. And what we're trying to say here is that there's one variable and that's all you need to know where you are in the gate cycle, and then you can define all, pa all joint patterns as a function of that. Uh, maybe, maybe that's the case, yes. Uh, that certainly could be the case. So, and if that's so, then there's very fast continuous modulation of this estimate. Very fast, I would say, based on, based on these results. 
Yeah, so nice talk. I like that a lot, actually. Um, but I just have a kind of a simple question for you. So you, you show this divergence and then reconvergence with what would be expected in uphill walking, and you showed it normalized to the gait cycle. And I was just wondering if the time delay you saw in that reconvergence would correspond to what you would expect from reflex response, mm -hmm. or if there might be something else underlying that. Yeah, um, it's about 75 milliseconds, which is what other people have observed with perturbation studies. So uh, you, you pose the difference between these, uh, these two options, the CPG and the feedback generator, so it's a complete dichotomy, but of course there's a whole range of possibilities in yeah. between those. Yeah. And um, I, I wanted to both point out and ask whether you've given some thought as to how you'd characterize different ways that these could be coupled, in part because uh, this, there's been a lot of work done on that in the past and how one would separate these two experimentally. Okay, so separate different definitions of central pattern generation, is that what you're asking? Different ways of coupling a central pattern generator oh. to mechanical, potentially mechanical feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I agree, and that also goes to, to Chris's question that there, there are different ways to, that, they, that could be coupled to, to a central oscillator of some sort, absolutely. Uh, but we're, what we're proposing, I think, is somewhat unique in that you don't need that to, to walk. You, all you need is to measure one variable from the, from the environment, or it's a combination of, your, of the environment and your body. Right? Um, but of course, when there are noisy sensors, you do need some estimation to correct for that. Very interesting talk. Uh, I was wondering if you'd considered collecting whole body kinematics to see how this perturbation plays out, not just in that, mm -hmm. that one angular variable, but the rest of the body's motion. Absolutely, that, that's the next step in this, in this project. Uh, we did not use motion capture in this case. We just used an uh, electrogoniometer. And so we could buy more electrogoniometers and do the knee and then maybe the hip. Uh, but motion capture really would be the next step in this. But we haven't done it yet. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I'm, I'm still trying to understand this exactly. So wh why do you need um, a, uh, a pattern generator to explain the results? You don't. So it, it can be explained just just with feedback. Yep. Yeah, it's just one way to interpret it. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, can you think of a way to, to separate those two concepts? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, first of all, it depends on what your definition of pattern generator is. I, I think of it as some sort of feed forward control contribution. Um, what I didn't say in the in the video of the prosthetic leg is that we have no feed forward control whatsoever. It's all feedback. So we're 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 looking at the center of pressure, and then and then um, correcting the error from the desired ankle angle to the and knee angle to the real ones. Um, so there's no feed forward control whatsoever. So it could be pure feedback, it could be. I just think that one interpretation is that you could have a feed forward pattern parameterized by a physical variable instead of time. That's one interpretation. The other one would be that it's pure feedback and that we're just, the feedback that you care about the most is this phase variable. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, if I could be allowed a second one. So, um, I'm trying to think how to phrase this exactly. Oh, we come back to you. I want to hear from Jesse. All right, let's do that. Thank you, Bobby. Um, so, one of the original perturbations we were looking at when using our version of the mechanical phase variable was shoving the robot forward or impeding its uh, progress, and if you really are synced to a phase variable, then other links slow down than, than just the phase variable itself. Right. You see this uh, synchronization. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you've tried, thought about, can do? I think that, that, that goes to Sam's question as well, that once we have the motion capture uh, and we're looking at different joint angles and links, then absolutely, that will give us a much clearer picture. This is, uh, I guess, the first preliminary evidence, I, I would say, in this idea, but we would like to do that. We haven't done it yet. <laughs> I didn't understand whether you were claiming that the location of the center of pressure was a special uh, and good measure of a phase variable, or if you took any of the hundred things which monotonically increase during a gate, that any of the others might have been just as good for your purposes as that one. I didn't. Just in your message, I didn't know whether you were 
let me just say it a different way, which is going to what uh, I think Chris is saying is, if you're saying you have a state feedback model, you want to you want to use the state to determine the outputs of the model, and um, and presumably your body senses lots of aspects of the state, and any one mm -hmm. is maybe as good as another, and mm -hmm. perturbing any one will perturb the system a little bit because your body's integrating things, and maybe the most excited sensor, the one you disturb, is the one that will be most listened to, or. Mm -hmm. So were you anyway? Were you saying there's something special about the center pressure, or was it just a, just a, a random guess, and you think another one, another guess would be just as good? Okay, well, uh, there's some truth to your statement, but it wasn't a random guess. I mean, there's a lot of evidence uh, that uh, load-related receptors initiate phase-specific behavior. Um, that study for for decades, and so I think the center pressure is related to that. Um, so that's where, that's what was, that was the motivation for that guess. But you're right, though. Any monotonic and an unactuated variable could could be the phase variable. And if it's one to one with the center of pressure during these perturbations, then you're right. It could have been another, another variable that was the root of this. But uh, first of all, it's hard to tease that out because we didn't measure the entire body. So in the future when we do that, we can tease that out a little bit more. Um, but yeah, there's evidence though that center of pressure is, is meaningful. The one we tried. This guess worked. You know, the center, like I think of the center pressure as being under your control as, as opposed to something that you're going to want to use to sense something about how things have changed for you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how do you, um, maybe you could talk a little bit more about why center pressure and why you think that's a good indicator as opposed yeah. to something else you might be able to sense that would be um, more, less about what you're intending to do and more about mm -hmm. uh, what's happening to you. That's a great question, and you're absolutely right that, for example, in human robotics, typically you want to control the center of pressure rather than, than measure it to control the things, right? So, 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 or, I mean, you're measuring it while you're controlling it, but I, I see your point, though, and you're absolutely right. Um, but we're, we're kind of changing the way we look at it. So we're looking at it as an independent variable rather than a dependent variable. And I, I will say that, that it's not directly actuated. It, it is a function of... of ankle torque and also the loads that are bared on the on the foot so it's not directly actuated you do have some control over it um, but I, I would say that the main reason for our our choice of COP as a phase variable is was based on the evidence of the role of loads in the initiation of these behaviors can you, can you explain why it's not under your actuation you're saying it's not directly actuated I don't see how it differs from other things that you would Actuate. So I, I could draw, it, it, the center of pressure is a function of the ankle torque and the vertical load and the horizontal load and the distances from the, the, the center of pressure to the ankle. And so the, those loads are where the body dynamics come in um, that you don't have direct actuation over. But isn't that true of any, anything in the body? That, it, that you know, those external loads are going to influence what's happening at, say, your ankle joint or your knee joint? Or they're influencing it in the dynamics, but not the, not the definition of the ankle joint. So the ankle joint isn't defined as being equal to loads, whereas the, but the, the, the center pressure is. See what I'm saying? I think so. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I'm Sung Moon Song, presenting the work done by me, Ruta Desai, and Harmut Geyer. We are from the Robotics Institute, and we thank NSF and NIH for funding us. We are interested in understanding the control of human locomotion and delivering practical controllers for robots. How we, what we do to understand human control is that we first develop a neuromuscular controller in simul simulation and then compare the results with measurable human data. This talk is about our development, simulation development of a robust 3D human locomotion model using primarily reflex control. So when I say neuromuscular control, it indicates that we implement some features known from physiology. One of them is the muscle dynamics. 
the contactile element of a muscle gets activation signal as input and exerts contactile force based on its length and velocity. Another feature that is known from physiology is the transmission delays from, of the sensory, sensory data and the activation signal. Based on the distance from the spinal cord to the muscle, the, acti the reflex delay can be up to 20 milliseconds. And we are not the only group that develop neuromuscular controllers. One of the advanced model is developed at Nagoya University. Their model can generate 3D locomotion, however, it cannot include reflex delays. Our, our 2010 model had no problem including reflex delays, however, it was restricted to the 2D sagittal plane. All of the models showed limited robustness. For example, it could only adapt to ground disturbances up to two, plus minus two centimeters. And because of that, they were seldom applied to controlling real robots. So how can we increase the robustness of locomotion? In this field, there's a consensus that a key element for robust locomotion is swing leg placement. It means that while walking, you can recover your balance by placing your swing leg at a good position. And the target swing leg placement can be represented as a target angle of the swing leg, alpha target. And there are literatures suggesting strategies for predicting footsteps reactively to disturbances. We adopt, one, adopt the one used as Symbicon due to its simplicity. Even though we have a footstep predictor, the control problem of swinging the leg to this target while walking is not solved. And the main part of our work is solving this problem using primarily reflex control. And let me give an example to give you a feeling of what I mean by reflex control. The example is our, one of our reflex control of vastus during stance. Vastus is a, the knee extensor muscle, and there are two reflex pathways running active during stance. One of them is positive force feedback, which can be written as this equation. ST is the muscle stim stimulation, G is a constant gain, and F, T minus delta T is a time-delayed sensory data, the force vastus exerted. The force data is delayed by 10 milliseconds because of the distance between the spinal cord and the muscle. And all of our reflex control encodes specific features, specific functionality. And for example, this positive force feedback generates compliant knee behavior. And the other pathway, which I won't go into detail, prevents knee overextension. So instead of me describing all the detailed reflex, I'll give the big picture about my, our controller based on the functionalities they encode. The control can, it has three phases, stance phase, swing phase, and the transition phase from stance to swing. Our stance control are based on our previous study that compliant leg behavior realizes walking and running, and that compliant leg behavior can be generated by positive force feedback. And our stance control in encodes other functionalities such as balancing the trunk and preventing knee overextension. The swing control gets alpha target, the target foot, foot step, as an input and swings to this target. Uh, Ruta will give a poster talk tomorrow so you can find her for the details of this control. The transition control from stance to swing begins as the double support phase begins. The control chooses the leg that is farther from alpha target to swing. And it suppresses some of the stance control path, stance reflex pathway, and excites some of the swing, swing reflex pathways based on the load the legs are bearing. And with all these functionalities encoded, our controller can generate locomotion behavior. The animation shows our, our, our walking with all control parameters optimized for energy efficiency. We also can optimize the control parameters on rough terrain to generate robust locomotion. Until now, we could train our 2D model to walk on a terrain with plus minus 16 centimeters. However, it doesn't mean that this model can walk on any terrain up to plus minus 16 centimeters. For example, it can fall down walking on a plus minus 10 centimeters. 
So we tested this model on different terrains of length of 10 meters and plotted the success rate. We can see that it can walk successfully on any terrains up to plus minus 4 centimeters and 50 about 50 percent of plus minus 8 and 10 centimeters. And the other blue line shows the success rate of our model trained at plus minus 8 centimeters and that of our 2010 model. Even though both model was trained at the same terrain, our new control model shows higher success rate. And we can train this model to adapt to different kind of terrain, different kind of disturbances. While walking across this terrain, there is no, no, no control parameter changes. It can walk down slopes and walk up slopes and walk on mud. The green line, line shows the reactive forces on the contact point, and you can see that the mud, mud pushes and also pulls. And it can also adapt to external pushes on the trunk. This 2D model extended to a 3D model with some modifications. The higher layer control, the first step predictor of the 2D model gives alpha target in the sagittal plane. We can use the same strategy to give, get alpha target in the lateral plane. And with additional muscles and hip, roll hip degree of freedom, we, could, we can swing to this target. We could train our 3D model to walk at plus minus 10 centimeters terrain. And as I mentioned, we are also interested on con using our neuromuscular controller for humanoid robots. To use our neuromuscular controller, you need to provide some sensory data. And those are joint angular data from encoders, pelvis data from an IMU, and force at the ankles from force sensors. And while this Atlas robot blindly walking on this plus minus 10 centimeter terrain, we observed maximum joint torque of 300 newton meters and maximum joint velocities of 10 radians per second. In the future, we are interested in generating diverse behaviors. For example, avoiding obstacles, walking upstairs, and walking backwards, and running. We aim for a controller that can generate diverse behaviors and make transition between all the behaviors. To sum up, a reflex-based control can utilize robust 3D bipedal walking. And our, our controller can generate blind walking on plus minus 10 centimeter terrain and is robust to sensory delays. Thank you. Hi, around slide four, you mentioned that your model was optimized for energy efficiency. Could you talk a little bit about what that function looks like? Um, I don't have the equation here, but um, so I use a formula from researchers that calculates um, like heat maintain contraction energy consumption. So it calculates the metabolic cost of the muscles. So I, I didn't, uh, I don't have the reference here, but I can you know, give you the picture of what I use. But so the optimization function uh, optimized for lowest energy and for in this case for target walking velocity. In the 3D model, you mentioned the IMU. In the 2D model, is there a reflex connected to the inner ear or is it completely um Force-based reflexes. 2D model. The sensory data I, our controller uses all the muscle, uh, some of the muscle states, and the global angle of the trunk, and the uh, force each leg like, are bearing. Oh, yes, I understand. Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, how is the lateral leg placement organized? Is it independent of the sagittal plane movement, or somehow coupled? Currently, it's independent. So there is an independent muscle for hip abductor and adductor. And similarly to the sagittal plane, it just gets a target leg placement. And uh, based on the difference, it swings toward that uh, target. 
So it's in the independent. So it's a fixed angle control or is a angular change over time or what is the program behind? So that is a question about our higher layer controller, which is the footstep predictor. Um, yeah, I have a slide for that. So there are like other studies that predict where you should place your foot when your system is disturbed. And we use the one that's called from that called Simpicon. It's that simple equation over there. It's based on the state of the center of mass. So if your center of mass is goes farther than normal and goes faster than normal, you should swing your leg farther. And yeah, that's the strategy we use. We also tested our model with a different strategy of ours called which is based on the linear inverted pendulum model and that also worked Similarly. This is for sagittal plane, yes? Um, so this yeah, so I run two, two of these equations uh, independent, uh, decoupled in the sagittal plane and the lateral plane. Okay. Related to the previous is there anything you want to call a phase variable? So I think all reflex pathways are like local phase, phase, what do you call it, phase control? Yeah. Oh, for all the control, the whole control. Or is that the the first one is kind of against our philosophy. The second one, I'm not a communist, but it's, yeah, it's close to our philosophy. Yeah. So I think the second one is closer to our philosophy. OK. Uh, I saw this food behavior in your simulation, the heel contact and toe contact. Uh -huh. uh, so are those including a control, or is just like happens with your controller? Um, so in our control, there is no specific like target trajectories we follow. Um, like most of the functionalities were what I explained in the, um, like in this like stance swing that, that slide. So it is the result of that local feedback of positive force feedback on the ankle. So we, don't, we do not like explicitly change plan for it, but oh, we know it happens. Could you comment on how you got the different types of behavior that you showed in the last but one slide? Oh. Uh, did you train explicitly for these uh, different behaviors? And uh, d does the biped know that the size of the step and the placement of the obstacles and things like that? Um, some were uh, designed to be like that. Some were, some I got by accident. Um, avoiding obstacles, I trained to lift up that leg high in, enough at that specific part. So that was designed. Walking upstairs, uh, that, is, that was trained at that terrain. So that was also designed. Walking backwards, I got it by accident. <laughs> I think I optimized for a specific speed, but it failed to walk at that speed and walked like that. <laughs> but I know that our controller is capable for that. So. <laughs> and the 3D running thing, that was also kind of accident. Um, it was while running the optimization until it like uh, find, found it was approaching the minimum of our cost. Um, that was what happened during that. So I think it, it's because as it ha has higher energy, it has higher possibility to survive on rough terrain. So it walks, walks or runs back. Hi. Um, so I noticed when you were walking over some of these surfaces with the different elevations that the ankle mechanics got a little wild at times. So I'm, I'm wondering, like they, they looked fine and they looked stable, but I'm wondering if you included things like uh, injury risk as part of your model. And did you look at peak strains in the muscle and assess that versus metabolic cost? Oh. Um, so normally I don't include that on the cost, but when I, not, not in this slide, but when I 
um, optimized for slow walking. Sometimes it showed like knee overextension. And to prevent those cases, I um, penalized like, knee, like joint overextensions and those. Um, but I don't think any of these behaviors really like had that cause, uh, that cause like active in there. So if you, saw, I'm not sure which motion you're talking about. If you saw an ankle like um, twisting yearly, then maybe it was pen it should have been penalized for uh, going over some range. Um, so to ge like generate these behaviors, how I optimize is I first uh, ask it to survive the terrain, and once it survives, I uh, wait until wait if it can generate steady state walking on plain ground, and then just uh, penalize during steady state. So actually none of the, if it survives the like, terrain, none of the motion in the terrain is like, uh, considered an optimization. Uh, each of these examples are where parameters are set at particular values, but can you actually, could you scale your parameters such that and then would you possibly see a, a spontaneous change of gait? Um, that is, I think that is something close to what we've done previously. What we've done previous, previously was we tried to identify a set of control parameters for different walking speeds and control the walking speeds ba like based on those tables of walking speeds. Um, so we know that we can do that, but we thought that is we thought that is not how human, that may not be how human control ourselves. So what we aim, what are we aiming now is that we want to identify like fewer controllers. For example, here it was like alpha target, which was a swing leg quickness, and identify like several more control parameters, like for example, change energy change, that a parameter that can regulate the energy change during stance or something of these important parameters and try to generate all these behavior by changing only a few of these parameters. So um, yes, we can uh, do speed control by having these table of set of parameters, but um, we're trying to do something uh, more sophisticated in the future. I think some of the concern about the what the feet were doing, it reflects the fact that the, all your models are wearing very stiff shoes. Can you comment on what changes when the foot has internal degrees of freedom and sort of soft heels and soft toes? Okay, our model does have stiff foot, but the uh, ground contact is modeled, ground is modeled with um, long linear spring dampers. So there are some damping there which I think corresponds to, in human, it corresponds to our um, like soul. And for the internal degree of freedom of the foot, um, we are also doing some, like trying to do some studies using this model, predicting the effect of, for example, internal degrees of freedom on the foot. And um, it's not at a point to make any like conclusion, but one thing we observed was having a soft foot actually incurs more energy cost. Um, that was from our like, like optimization results. Um, I don't have a good interpretation for that yet, but maybe it can be something like uh, series elastic actuator. If you have a compliance element, you, have, you lose the control authority, but you can like, handle impacts better. Right. I think that that's all I can say about um, internal integration. First, I want to start by thanking Hartmut and Steve and Chris for uh, this opportunity to speak to you guys. Um, the title's very misleading. When I realized I was going to be speaking after Andy and when I gave greater consideration to what you guys might be interested in, I decided to focus uh, my talk less on what I'm doing, which is developing a sensory neuroprosthesis, and more on why I'm doing it. Okay, So hopefully we can have um, some 
extended discussion about that, and I have a bunch of slides at the end of the talk that show exactly what I'm doing if you want to um, hear more about that. But what I really want to do is, is uh, engage you in a discussion about why we need sensory feedback or what, what um, roles sensory feedback might play um, in the control of prostheses, such as the one I think Andy demonstrated. So what you're seeing here is um, arguably the most advanced upper extremity prosthesis. Um, we can argue about that if you want. Um, I'd rather not. Um, it has 22 degrees of freedom. It's um, anthropomorphic in um, uh, almost all ways. It, it uh, can move as quickly and as uh, uh, forcefully as the average male, I think the average military male, since this is um, developed um, with funding from DARPA um, by the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. So you can see in the, in the tasks that, um, that this arm is performing that it's, it's quite dexterous. It can manipulate um, small objects in, in, uh, in forceful ways. Um, but if you notice at the beginning of the talk, it was being controlled um, completely um, by an able-bodied individual whose motions were being captured um, through various uh, motion capture uh, tools. You know, obviously, the, uh, the target audience is someone um, uh, who has an amputation, and we, the goal is to restore um, that anthropomorphic upper extremity function uh, to those individuals um, by channeling control signals, um, not through the normal ways, but, but through um, alternatives. Uh, and what Andy talked about this morning was using uh, microelectrode interfaces implanted in primary motor cortex with the goal of extracting some sort of command signals um, from those motor areas of the brain, and then through some um, not so sophisticated math, um, it's really quite straightforward actually. Um, there's some extraction of uh, what the animal or person is intending to do. And what's crucial to all of this is really the feedback um, pathways, the feedback processes that, that, um, that are engaged when the, animal is, when the animal or the human is performing some goal-directed task. In most cases, that feedback is restricted to uh, vision alone, okay, so that if it's a monkey or if it's a person, they're instructed to perform some task, and they're able to uh, gauge their performance by, um, by watching what the limb is doing. Um, more recently, there, there's been effort to try to engage other uh, sensory pathways as well, such as the somatosensory pathways, which um, we know, uh, particularly in the case of locomotion, are absolutely essential, sorry, I don't know what happened there, um, for controlling movement. Okay, so the, the two takeaway messages that, that I want um, to, that, that you guys to go away with are one, that, that somatosensory feedback of limb state is absolutely crucial um, for, for not only sensing um, actions, but for planning and regulating those actions as they're ongoing. In the upper, in the upper extremity uh, work, there's a lot of focus on sensation and providing amputees with some conscious percept of what the limb is doing or, or what um, uh, pressures are being exerted on, on the um, prosthetic hand. I would argue that it's as much about the subconscious feedback of, of limb state that the nervous system needs to regulate its motor output. And whether that motor output's being tapped um, in the brain at the level of motor cortex or at the level of muscles in, in the case of myelectric control, that feedback of limb state, I think, um, is ab absolutely essential for, um, for those motor signals to be maximally useful. And I'll, I'll spend the most of my time talking and showing you some examples of why I think that's important. And then the, the second point is how um, I and my lab are working to do this. Um, you know, we're targeting the dorsal root ganglion, which is um, a uh, part, portion of the spinal nerve that contains only sensory, uh, sensory afferents, primary sensory afferents. And we're placing microelectrode arrays there. These are high density uh, arrays of needles that each can um, recruit. Uh, small numbers of muscle or cutaneous afferents, and um, we've been, we have some nice data that shows that this is a, a very effective way to engage these pathways, and we can create patterns of stimulation that we think are effective for, for providing both tactile feedback of um, object interaction, but also proprioceptive, proprioceptive feedback of, of limb state. And now that we're doing work in behaving animals, we can also um, get a better sense of whether or not any of these procedures are, are painful, um, and that uh, doesn't seem to be the case, so uh, we're encouraged. Uh, 
Okay, so um, we've had a couple of nice talks this morning talking about um, the importance of perhaps dominance of feedback in controlling locomotion. Um, that's also true in the upper extremity that, that the sensory feedback is, is used both at spinal and supraspinal levels to um, regulate ongoing uh, motor actions. Uh, here's a nice example um, uh, drawn somewhat at random from the locomotion literature. Um, there's a number of uh, authors that have uh, uh, shown the, this uh, same point, including Max Donnellan, who's in the audience, that sensory feedback from muscle afferents um, plays a dominant role in uh, regulating the ongoing motor output from muscles. So it's clear in the case of locomotion that without sensory feedback, um, motor output would be inadequate. It's less clear in the case of the upper extremity and, and certainly in the, the decades of research that have gone into developing brain-computer interfaces for controlling reaching, the only mode of feedback that, that's ever been provided is, is vision. Um, and until recently, um, the, the role of proprioceptive feedback in augmenting that, that BCI control hasn't really been, been understood. And so uh, this is some, uh, a paper that I'm just going to highlight um, that uh, uh, Aaron Siminski um, published a few years ago working in Nico Atsopoulos' lab where they had a, a monkey performing a, a standard BCI task, you know, controlling cursor movements on a screen. Um, and his arm um, was fit in an exoskeleton, a robotic exoskeleton. So in some cases, the monkey could move the arm himself. In other cases, um, he moved uh, the cursor uh, using his brain. And in, in some tasks, the arm, uh, while passive, was, was set to follow the actions that were being commanded by the brain. And in this way, um, they were able to extract the, the role or the, the facil facilitatory effect that proprioceptive feedback had on controlling um, the, the task with his brain. And what they found, and I'm doing a, trying to go through this very quickly, but the, what they found is that doing the BCI task with, with proprioception was much better. Recently, um, not, did Andy talk about the, the human study that's ongoing at, at University of Pittsburgh? Okay, so then I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. So this is uh, Jan Sherman. Um, this is our, our first subject in our, our first human study of, of these brain-computer interfaces. She has a pair of 100 electrode uh, microarrays in her primary motor cortex, and she's able to control um, this robotic arm to do some, I think, pretty amazing things. And, you know, just, I'm sure Andy may, may have shown this video, but, you know, she's able to do pick-and-place um, tasks fairly well. Um, I think that at her best, she was able to uh, achieve 10 degrees of freedom of, of independent control. So, so her control is, is quite remarkable. But one of the things that, that got me really um, excited was that um, because of Jan's condition, while she's paralyzed, she's also fully sensate. So she has a sense of touch, she has full sense of proprioception. So I thought that uh, my, I and my colleagues thought this would be a, a great opportunity to test whether or not um, having that proprioceptive feedback available to her would help her control. So, and I, you can imagine that the, the, the easiest way to do this experiment would to be to put her arm in an in a upper extremity exoskeleton and then have her control the exoskeleton. Um, but since we don't have one of those available, we had to do the next best thing. And I'll, I'll show you in a minute what that was. So he, here's the task. Um, in one minute, uh, Jan had to move the, the arm back and forth in a, a simple target uh, tracking task, just two targets on either side of the line. And she had to do that as many times as she could in a minute, just a very simple task. And we did it um, with vision, and in this case, without proprioception. And not surprisingly, um, she did very well. She's able to move the arm uh, back and forth, um, no problem. Uh, she can do that many times over the course of the minute. In the next case, we asked her to close her eyes and eventually we blindfolded her and we asked her to repeat the task. So now she has no feedback whatsoever. She's, she's got to try to remember where the arm is or, or, and anticipate where it's going based on the signals she's uh, generating in her brain. And you can see that the first couple, in the first uh, 10 or 20 seconds, she does okay, but eventually she loses track of the, the limb completely and it drifts off and, and remains at some extreme uh, position in the workspace. In a, another set of trials, we um, 
again with her blindfolded now, we moved her arm to try to mimic the motion of the prosthetic limb. So now we're, we're trying to give her that proprioceptive feedback she'd have if she were moving her own arm. And in this case, she can go the, the full minute um, uh, without losing track of the limb. Her control is um, uh, perhaps as good and in some cases better than when she just has uh, vision alone. And, we can, and one of the comments that we thought was interesting is that uh, Jan mentioned that she, she thinks um, more about getting her own arm to move when she's doing the task this way than thinking about the prosthesis. So, so clearly uh, indicating that she's embodying the prosthesis more um, in this case. And then here's just some data that shows that the purple bars are nearly as big uh, as the blue bars, which is good. Um, <laughs> Uh, but basically that when with just proprioception, if she only has that proprioceptive input of her arm moving, she can do nearly as well as, as uh, when her arm is move, when she has uh, full vision. And so um, that's encouraging. That's how we're trying to do it in, uh, uh, in uh, patients that don't have the, the, that full sensation. So I'll take your questions. Let's take your questions. I'm just struck by this last slide, and forgive my in ignorance. This one? Or yes, this okay. one here. Um, forgive my ignorance, but how does it come to be that uh, that afferents in some form are preserved when efferents are not? Um, OK, so, so what the question is, where's the pointer? So the question is, how come these pathways are lost and these are preserved? Um, so, so the only thing that's true about that statement is that the muscles are often lost in a prosthesis, or I'm sorry, in an amputee. Are you talking about a, a spinal cord injured person, or are you talking about? Oh, okay. So if, if it's with regards to that. So the nerves are generally healthy up to the point of amputation. Okay, so the motor signals, the motor pathways remain and the sensory pathways remain. They just, the effectors are gone if you lose, you know, the portion of the limb that contains the muscles, right? And so in, in many amputees, that's not the case. You know, a, a portion of the limb is gone, but many of the effectors remain. And that's why myoelectric prostheses, you know, are, are feasible. And even in those cases, even if the muscles are lost, then there's techniques like targeted motor re which can be used to, to restore them as well. So, you know, but, you, the simple answer to your question is these nerves remain viable even in the case of a very high level peripheral nerve injuries like brachial plexus injuries. The spinal nerve roots are um, in many cases within the wall of the, uh, within the walls of the spinal column. So the por this portion of the nerve is healthy. I think that was a long answer to a short question. Yeah, but I'm still puzzled by this. Like I've seen Jane moving her arm and she has a spinal cord injury. She cannot move her arm, but you moved her arm around and she, she still has sensation. There is no amputation. How, how can that be? So her injury has spared her sensory pathways. I mean, and this, this is true of a number of people with spinal cord injury. Not all people that have a spinal cord injury, you know, if they're, they, they may be paralyzed but sensate or they may be, um, insensate and have some motor function. I mean, it just depends on the nature of the injury. And, and to be clear, you know, what we're, the approach that we're taking by targeting these primary afferents won't work for those people with spinal cord injury that, that, that don't have sensation. I mean, we, we're relying on an intact spinal, on, on intact ascending pathways. And our, our goal is, is to do this for amputees. And, and, and JAN is being used in a study that's ultimately geared towards helping amputees. Chris, or sorry, is it, do I have the liberty of picking my poison? Well, my colleague is suggesting that. that. But yeah, I would, I would agree. Yeah. I, I would like to just uh, throw some cold water on that. 
Okay. And maybe I'm really talking about functional electrical stimulation. Uh, if this I had is a not choice, what I'm talking about. I know. Okay. But if I had a choice of an exoskeleton controlled by a computer versus an exoskeleton controlled by functional electrical stimulation, because it's so difficult to make sense of the neural signals, they're, they're delayed, I think I'm better off signaling high-level intent, you know, take me there, and letting the computer drive than I am trying to control all the degrees of freedom. And I think that same argument applies here. So that may be the case, but I think it depends on how much control the user wants. Like if the user just wants something, some, someone or something to help them, and they're able to feel, you know, what they want is independence. Okay, and if they can get that independence by having a robot that does their tasks at will, then maybe that's all they need. You know, but if they want a greater level of control, you know, that they can, that they're not limited to sort of a, um, a menu of options, that they can do anything they want, you know, without um, restriction, then perhaps your approach is inadequate. Okay? So, um, with this slide where you in referenced earlier, where you give people, stimulate the dorsal root ganglia to give them feedback. Uh, that's a very coarse sort of feedback that you're getting for a motor action. I'm wondering uh, how much that actually helps in terms of the control and addition to sort of learning of the new action. So those are two very interesting questions that we hope to um, get some answers to at some point, but we're not there yet. I mean, it's, it's our belief that providing even rudimentary feedback will be helpful, but we don't yet have, I mean, we haven't done the experiments yet. We, we've just recently started doing experiments in awake and locomoting cats. We're moving in the direction of doing this in awake and behaving monkeys, and you know, with the ultimate goal of getting into patients. There's going to be some sort of stimulation, so let's just shock the, the ganglia and get some sort of feedback, or is, is it just sort of like a no, 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 no. We we want to provide very. Um, I don't want to say precise, but we want to um, provide very specific patterns of input that, that are naturalistic um, in, in whatever sense that's achievable with, with what's going to be crude stimulation. I mean, the, we're, we're not, we don't have technology yet um, to reproduce natural patterns of, of, of afferent activity in the 20,000 afferents that course through a single goes through a ganglia. So no matter what, it's going to be coarse. But you know, devices like the cochlear implant started with a single channel and had profound impact on uh, uh, patients' ability to hear. So you know, whether or not we'll have the same level of success, doubtfully, you know, but what level we need to get to to have a, a positive impact on function is not known. Like the idea that uh, that the motor cortex encodes velocity, and I'm just wondering on the sensory so side, some. what do we know about what things encode? I guess on the periphery here, you know a little bit about what muscle spindles encode and things like that. But as you go higher up, basically, what what is this somatosensory cortex encoding? Um, so that's a great question. One of the depending on who you ask, you might get different answers. I think in in the somato in the the tactile areas of somatosensory cortex, where people have looked at um, the response, the, the coding of afferents, of, of afferent neurons for textures and um, uh, surface properties, it's perhaps well, more well known. I think in areas like more proprioceptive regions, it's, it's less clear. Um, and I would argue that in all cases, we don't really know, even in motor cortex. I mean, there's a lot of literature, like Andy, um, is a strong proponent and has lots of great data that all of motor cortex cares about velocity, but I think there's a lot of competing data as well. And, and the truth is, it's not going to be simple regardless of, of whether it's a motor or a sensory area. Those neurons are integrating input from thousands of other neurons, and each of those thousands of other neurons are integrating information from, you know, again, several thousand neurons. So whatever signals we have in, in any of those central locations, it's going to be you know, a mix of a mixed bag. 
you know, and one of the reasons I prefer the periphery is that we do have a snowball's chance in hell of understanding and perhaps even replicating some of that code. Um, thanks for uh, inviting me here. Uh, so my name is uh, Carmel, uh, and I run the uh, Soft Machines Lab uh, here at CNU. And uh, part of our mission is to create what I call uh, soft matter technologies, and these would be used for robotic robotics uh, robots that engage in very intimate uh, physical contact with the human body. So applications could be second skin type, you know, wearable uh, computing, uh, like we've been talking about uh, some. Uh, human motor uh, assistance, so basically wearable robots, exoskeletons, also uh, humanoid type uh, co-robots. And uh, kind of one of my claims, I don't really have a very strong scientific uh, justification for this. It's something that I kind of, it's almost intuitive, and I pretty much, in our group at least, we kind of dogmatically adhere to this principle of compliance matching. And that is that if we're going to make technology, so if we're going to make electronics, sensors, actuators, for these types of applications, uh, we have to adhere to this principle of preserving the natural mechanics of the host. Um, or in other words, to, to kind of preserve our natural, uh, say, mobility, uh, our comfort, uh, safety, we have to introduce new classes of, uh, say, electronic sensors technologies that are elastically compatible. They match the elastic uh, compliance of natural human tissue, okay, so like our skin, our, say, muscle tissue, our organs. Um, and kind of one way uh, I think about elastic rigidity is in terms of Young's modulus, okay, so just a very simple measure of uh, how, say, uh, force uh, scales, or, or I should say more of kind of the uh, elastic resistance to stretching uh, uh, scales uh, for different materials. And for the most part, when it comes to the materials that we use in conventional machines and robots, uh, we use uh, materials like hard plastics and metals that have a Young's modulus that are orders of magnitude higher than the materials that go into natural organisms, okay? So if you think about, um, say, hard plastics or metals, we're talking about Young's modulus on the order of 10 to the 9 pascals, okay? So gigapascals all the way up to terapascals, orders of magnitude higher than, say, human skin, which has a modulus more on the order of hundreds of kilopascals, okay? So there's this huge kind of wide gap between the materials that we use in engineering versus the materials that arise in nature. And so kind of my argument is that if we want to make, say, our machines, robots, uh, more compatible with the human body, safer, more comfortable to wear, uh, if we want to have bio-inspired machines uh, and robots uh, that do exhibit some of the versatility and multifunctional, multifunctionality that we see in nature, we do have to seriously re-examine the kinds of materials that we use uh, in engineering. And in kind of one of the first places uh, uh, where we kind of want to start, at least in my group, kind of re-examining materials is in electronics and starting to shift to kind of new paradigms in stretchable electronics. And there's always been uh, you know, already some work uh, in this field. Uh, this is work out of, largely out of University of Illinois, uh, so UI UIUC, uh, also Northwestern University. This, this is actually kind of approach to stretchable electronics that was pioneered out of Princeton about 10 years ago, where you get stretchable functionality with very thin films of, say, metal foils and, and, and semiconductors. Um, kind of an another kind of paradigm in structural electronics, also fairly mature at this point, are um, stretchability using conductive elastomers, so just taking any kind of conductive micro nanoparticles, mixing it into a soft elastomer. Um, and, and this is actually, you know, very, this is something we do, so we don't do wavy electronics in my group. We do do uh, quite a great deal of work with these conductive elastomers. Uh, they're very easy to, to manufacture in the process. You can just laser micro machine them into any kind of microelectronic type uh, circuit. Um, kind of a, another uh, kind of approach to stretchable electronics. So these are electronics that would be intrinsically elastic, uh, and that's by just taking elastic sheets and then embedding them with microchannels of conductive fluids. And, and one kind of emerging technique uh, that's kind of growing in popularity is to use uh, metals that are liquid uh, at room temperature. Uh, and it actually turns out of these three different approaches of stretchable electronics, uh, these uh, liquid phase uh, metals are actually the oldest techniques. So this actually dates back to the 1940s. I mean, 
uh, you know, in the biomechanics community, like for stretchable uh, electric wiring, they would take uh, rubber tubes and they would fill it with mercury. And so you would have something as you stretch the, the, the tube, the, the mercury, I mean, you still have the conductivity of the metal, but it, the wiring would remain intact as you, as you stretch the tubing. And pretty much the same principle uh, applies here. And kind of just over the decades, almost, you could say that this technique to stretch electronics has been just rediscovered from, from time to time. Um, now, what's kind of special about liquid phase electronics, and why don't I spend most of this talk just on, on this technology, uh, is that uh, in addition to being hyperelastic, highly stretchable electronics uh, or wiring, uh, these also function as hyperelastic sensors. Okay, so you can use these to measure uh, surface pressure. Um, uh, so detecting contact, um, you can use them for mending, uh, measuring, say, joint angles, uh, or bending curvature. Uh, also shear, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about some of these uh, sensing modes with liquid phase uh, electronics. Um, okay, so as I said, uh, we can take elastomer and then we can embed it with uh, these uh, liquid features. So this is uh, a very soft silicone uh, rubber. Um, soft is kind of marketed as, as softer than skin, uh, and it's embedded with um, a, a liquid phase gallium indium alloy. Um, and so almost the same conductivity as this conventional copper wiring. And the way we've kind of patterned it is into these uh, parallel plate electrodes. And so the electrodes are liquid, okay? So we can stretch this elastomer, we can push down, the electrodes remain intact and they, and they remain functional. Uh, so that's capacitive sensing. I'm just pretty much gonna go, just kind of to raise awareness about this capability, I'm just gonna go over all the different kind of uh, sensing modes that we can achieve with uh, these. Uh, liquid phase gallium indium alloys. Uh, okay, so that was uh, capacitive uh, pressure sensing. Um, there's also pressure, pressure sensing with resistance. Actually, my uh, first contribution in this area was uh, on this uh, mode of, of pressure sensing. So uh, just an elastomer with this straight microfluid channel of gallium indium. As you push down, you collapse the channel, you change its electric resistance. And uh, the kind of principles and theory behind this uh, is actually you know, very simple kind of straightforward extension of classical solutions in 3D elasticity, fraction mechanics, combining that with Ohm's law. And you can get a pretty good prediction for how surface pressure match, uh, maps with relative changes in electric resistance. And so we have pretty reliable theories that are in good agreement with the experiment without any kind of data fitting. Um, and I can say that for pretty much all the different uh, uh, modes of elastic uh, deformation. Um, so just kind of one application of this could be, say, a wearable keypad. Um, this is actually work done by Rebecca Kramer. She was a, a PhD student at Harvard who I was advising uh, on this project. Um, but the idea here is that we have some type of electronic sensing functionality without using any kind of rigid materials, okay? So just using elastomers and fluids, we have something that you can just wear on your skin. It's comfortable, it, it kind of conforms to your body, it doesn't really interfere. Uh, with your natural motion. Okay, so that's uh, pressure sensing. Uh, also, just kind of redesigning these uh, microfluid channels, we can uh, also measure a bending curvature. Um, again, fairly reasonable agreement between theory and uh, experiment. Um, and one natural application of that could be, say, uh, a uh, finger joint sensor. Okay, so again, elastic deformation in this case Bending curvature maps to some relative change in electric resistance. Um, stretch sensing, either through capacitance uh, or uh, changes in, in resistance. Um, and then uh, kind of shear sensing. So the idea is you could have this kind of combined uh, pressure and shear sens uh, sensor on your fingertips. This, is, this design is composed of uh, uh, four electrodes that kind of share a common uh, type of ground or capacitive uh, type electrode. Uh, and we can independently measure uh, shear strains and also pressure. Okay, so just to quickly close, um, just some grand sweeping claims. Uh, my kind of vision is that eventually, for certain applications in bio-inspired robots uh, and wearable robotics, um, the rigid hardware and electronics are gonna be replaced with basically all soft matter technologies, okay? Just soft matter electronics, sensors, uh, actuators, they'll have no rigid materials, they'll be composed entirely of fluids, uh, gels, elastomers, the elastomers will have a modulus of 
say, a megapascal or less, so literally softer uh, than skin. Um, so just again, kind of going back to our spectrum of, of Young's modules, kind of really this paradigm shift from using rigid materials uh, in our machines and electronics, kind of shifting over to uh, softer, elastic, and stretchable materials. Um, and just again, potential applications could be in wearable robotics, uh, bot-inspired robots for field exploration, and also humanoid co-robots, basically with robot skin and, and artificial muscles uh, for these technologies. Uh, we're gonna have a, a few demos uh, on Thursday. Um, uh, so hopefully you guys can uh, drop by. We can show you just some of the examples of these uh, liquid phase microfluid elect electronics and sensors and also some of the work we've been doing with uh, conduct uh, laser patterning, uh, conductive elastomers. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, what do you mean? How do you transmit load? Oh, um, you can't. I mean, that uh, with something that's soft, it's not going to be very good with transmitting load. So one kind of feature, well, not with the sensors I showed you, but another very important functionality that we're aiming for are elastomers that can reversibly change the rigidity. So going from basically one end of the spectrum to the other, you know, within milliseconds. So uh, with the liquid elastomers, you're kind of limited by the periodic table on what's available. Can you right. talk a little bit about cost and toxicity with your room temperature metals? Right. Um, so we have done some pricing. The liquid, uh, the gallium indium alloys are non-toxic. Uh, um, I mean, they haven't been FDA. I mean, they are used in some commercial products. Um, they're using like thermometers, uh, for example. I mean, uh, so they're kind of like a non-toxic alternative uh, to mercury. Um, uh, so they, they're pretty, in terms of cost, um, I want to say, I would say they're, I mean, for the kinds of quantities we're using, they're, they're not terribly expensive. I mean, about a dollar a gram. Hi, thanks. Um, I was curious about the effects of the environment, specifically electrical fields or temperature or anything else that these sensors might be sensitive to. Yeah, I mean, they would be sensitive to that. I mean, not just the, the, the liquid phase metal, but also the, the surrounding elastomer. Um, I mean, they'll, I mean, they'll uh, uh, be sensitive to changes in heat. Um, I mean, one kind of argument for using resistive capacitor, uh, sorry, resistive sensing over capacitive sensing is so that we're not as sensitive to kind of any kind of conductive surfaces in the environment. Um, I just want to understand the compliance matching. So maybe I could say what I'm understanding. You can tell me if I have it. But it, it's not so much compliance matching, but you'd like things to be infinitely high compliance and just that it doesn't matter to get so right. compliant, like when yeah, you get I'm about abusing, Yeah, I'm kind of stealing compliance matching from, I mean, I'm kind of abusing the, that term. Um, yeah, we're, we basically want the base, these technologies to be so soft that they would have absolutely no influence on the host uh, mechanics. Right, and then and um, somewhere around the, uh, the compliance of the thing you're interfacing right. with, it starts to disappear. Right, but exactly, it, right. Yeah, okay, got it. Yeah, and presumably these are kind of thin enough that in terms of just the, the overall volume, they, I mean, if you factor that in also, yeah, they wouldn't really have that much of an influence on the mechanics. Thanks. Um, how is the uh, noise and drift compared to other like hard sensors um, with with these ones? Um, you here? We haven't we haven't looked at that very carefully. I mean, at this we're at the stage now. We're just trying to identify some of the underlying mechanisms and mechanics. Okay, thank you. Now, there is, I mean, in practice, we can use these again and again. I mean, they are, I mean, they do function as, as sensors. I mean, there is some modest, modest drift, um, but probably more of that has to do with the viscoelasticity of the elastomer than the actual electronic properties of the uh, liquid metal. Believe it or not, there are different ideologies in the soft matter business. I would characterize yours as a goo guy. 
A goo guy? A goo, G-O-O guy. Okay. An alternative is someone who's interested in tensile structures, which right. are very stiff in one direction, right. but compressible. And that leads us, for example, to inflatable structures that are, you know, can bear huge loads. We build buildings out of them. Right. You might think I'm advocating building a robot that's the Michelin Man. Uh, it sounds crazy, but actually a spacesuit is exactly that. Yeah. So uh, it's not clear that we want everything to be goo. Oh, no. I mean, and you wouldn't want your aircraft carrier to be goo, I mean, goo either. I mean, like, this, this, this would be a compl I mean, this would complement existing technologies. I mean, the advantage of, of this is that it's scale invariant. I mean, at any length scale, it's going to be soft and elastic, as opposed to some of these consecutive structures, as opposed to the wavy electronics, where if you kind of get below some type of length scale, suddenly you're dealing with, again, kind of rigid, inextensible material. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I would, I, I would really limit this to, you know, certain, you know, applications. Um, so given that you're working with a uh, metal that's in liquid state, how concerned are you for like the freezing point and how bad for these de these flexible devices would it be if it did get cold enough to uh, go solid? Would it completely destroy the, the uh, device? It wouldn't, no. I mean, if, if it got, I mean, the uh, it would still kind of remain functional. In fact, we actually take advantage of the freezing in terms of fabrication, so I haven't kind of gone over like the, the different kind of fabric fabrication techniques that we use. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I could say that for, I, I could, I guess, imagine in certain cases, yeah, you'd lose functionality when it's, when it's cold. But you almost think about it. I mean, some of the work previous to this was with low melting point solders. So it was in solid state in these microfluidic channels. This is work out of uh, Harvard, um, kind of back around like 2006, 2007. Um, and so it was basically kind of like frozen already, and it was still somewhat flexible and stretchable. Yeah. So, um, so in, in most of your applications, you're, you're looking for a mechanical sensor where there's right. some deformation that you can sense, whether right, it's exactly. a force or a, yeah. a curvature or whatever. If, if the goal is to measure a bioelectrical signal, which is what I do, right. um, it, but you want a conformable sensor, right. do you have any materials that would be insensitive to the mechanical deformation but would still be able to transduce, say, an ionic current? I mean, if you're kind of clever with the design, I mean, you could come up with, say, using the, the conductive PDMS or the, or the liquid uh, electronics so it wouldn't respond to certain modes of elastic deformation, but it would still remain functional and it could function as a, say, an electrode for, you know, EMG or, or FES or whatever, yeah. Cool. So to that point, why not get the factory people to I mean, basically, you would need the elastomers to carry it for it, yeah, but that's basically what you'd be doing. Yeah. I mean, that's... I guess I'll go to Carson Street. <laughs>